Chapter 18, Part 1 of Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Maria Casper. Fifty Years in Chains, or the Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 18, Part 1 The month of November is, in all years, a season of clouds and vapors. But at the time of which I write, the good weather vanished early in the month, and all the clouds of the universe seem to have collected in North Carolina. From the second night after crossing the Catawba, I did not see the North Star for the space of three weeks and during all this time no progress was made in my journey. Although I seldom remained two days in the same place, but moved from one position to another for the purpose of eluding the observation of the people of the country, whose attention might have been attracted by the continual appearance of the smoke of my fires in one place. There had as yet been no hard frost, and the leaves were still on the oak trees, at the close of this cloudy weather, but the northwest wind which dispelled the mist also brought down nearly all the leaves of the forest, except those of the evergreen trees, and the nights now became clear, and the air keen with frost. Hitherto the oak woods had afforded me the safest shelter, but now I was obliged to seek for groves of young pines to retire to at dawn. Heretofore I had found a plentiful subsistence in every cornfield and potato lot that fell in my way, but now began to find some of the fields in which corn had grown destitute of the corn, and containing nothing but the stalks. The potatoes had all been taken out of the lots where they grew, except in some few instances where they had been buried in the field, and the means of subsistence became every day more difficult to be obtained. But as I had fine weather, I made the best use of those hours in which I dared to travel, and was constantly moving, from a short time after dark until daylight. The toil that I underwent for the first half of the month of December was excessive, and my sufferings, for want of food, were great. I was obliged to carry with me a stock of corn sufficient to supply me for two or three days, for it frequently happened that I met with none in the fields for a long time. In the course of this period I crossed innumerable streams, the greater portion of which were small size, but some were of considerable magnitude, and in all of them the water had become almost as cold as ice. Sometimes I was fortunate enough to find boats or canoes tied at the side of the streams, and when this happened I always made free use of that which no one else was using at the time. But this did not occur often and I believe that in those two weeks I swam over nine rivers or streams, so deep that I could not ford them. The number of creeks and rivulets through which I waded was far greater, but I cannot now fix the number. In one of these fine nights, passing near the house of a planter, I saw several dry hides hanging on poles under a shed. One of these hides I appropriated to myself, for the purpose of converting it into moccasins, to supply the place of my boots, which were totally worthless. By beating the dry hide with a stick, it was made sufficiently pliable to bear making it into moccasins, of which I made for myself three pair, wearing one and carrying the others on my back. One day, as I lay in a pine thicket, several pigs, which appeared to be wild, having no marks on their ears, came near me, and one of them approached so close without seeing me that I knocked it down with a stone and succeeded in killing it. This pig was very fat and would have weighed thirty if not forty pounds. Feeling now greatly exhausted with the fatigues that I had lately undergone, and being in a very great forest far removed from white inhabitants, I resolved to remain a few days in this place, to regale myself with the flesh of the pig which I preserved by hanging it up in the shade after cutting it into pieces. Fortune, so adverse to me heretofore, 
seem to have been more kind to me at this time, for the very night succeeding the day on which I killed the pig, a storm of hail, snow, and sleet came on, and continued fifteen or sixteen hours. The snow lay on the ground, four inches in depth, and the whole country was covered with a crust almost hard enough to bear a man. In this state of weather I could not travel, and my stock of pork was invaluable to me. The pork was frozen where it hung on the branches of the trees, and was as well preserved as if it had been buried in snow. But on the fourth day after the snow fell, the atmosphere underwent a great change. The wind blew from the south, the snow melted away, the air became warm, and the sun shone with the brightness and almost with the warmth of spring. It was manifest that my pork, which was now soft and oily, would not long be in a sound state. If I remained here, my provisions would become putrid on my hands in a short time, and compel me to quit my residence to avoid the atmosphere of the place. I resolved to pursue my journey, and prepared myself by roasting before the fire all my pork that was left, wrapping it up carefully in green pine leaves, and enveloping the whole in a sort of close basket that I made of small boughs of trees. Equipping myself for the journey, with my meat in my knapsack, I again took to the woods, with the stars for my guide, keeping the north star over my left eye. The weather had now become exceedingly variable, and I was seldom able to travel more than half the night. The fields were muddy, the low grounds in the woods were wet and often covered with water, through which I was obliged to wade. The air was damp and cold by day, the nights were frosty, very often covering the water with ice an inch in thickness. From the great degree of cold that prevailed, I inferred either that I was pretty far north, or that I had advanced too much to the left and was approaching the mountain country. To satisfy myself as far as possible of my situation, one fair day, when the sky was very clear, I climbed to the top of a pine tree that stood on the summit of a hill, and took a wide survey of the region around me. Eastward I saw nothing but a vast continuation of plantations intervened by forests. On the south the faint beams of a winter sun shed a soft luster over the woods, which were dotted at remote distances with the habitations of men, and the openings that they had made in the green champagne of the endless pine groves that nature had planted in the direction of the midday sun. On the north, at a great distance, I saw a tract of low and flat country, which, in my opinion, was the vale of some great river, and beyond this, at the farthest stretch of vision, the eye was lost in the blue transparent vault where the extremity of the arch of the world touches the abode of perpetual winter. Turning westward, the view passed beyond the region of pine trees, which was followed afar off by naked and leafless oaks, hickories, and walnuts, and still beyond these rose high in the air elevated tracts of country clad in the white livery of snow and bearing the impress of midwinter. It was now apparent that I had borne too far westward, and was within a few days' travel of the mountains. Descending from my observations, I determined, on the return of night, to shape my course for the future nearly due east, until I should at least be out of the mountains. According to my calendar, it was the day before Christmas that I ascended the pine tree, and I believe I was at that time in the northwestern part of North Carolina, not far from the banks of the Yadkin River. On the following night I traveled from dark until, as I supposed, around three or four o'clock in the morning, when I came to a road which led, as I thought, in an easterly direction. This road I traveled until daylight, and encamped near it in an old field overgrown with young pines and holly trees. This was Christmas Day, and I celebrated it by breakfasting on fat pork, without salt, and substituted parched corn for bread. In the evening the weather became cloudy and cold, and when night came it was so dark that I found difficulty in keeping the road, 
at some points where it made short angles. Before midnight it began to snow, and at break of day the snow lay more than a foot deep. This compelled me to seek winter quarters, and fortunately, at about half a mile from the road, I found, on the side of a steep hill, a shelving rock that formed a dry covert with a southern prospect. Under this rock I took refuge, and kindling a fire of dry sticks, considered myself happy to possess a few pounds of my roasted pork, and more than half a gallon of corn that I carried in my pockets. The snow continued falling, until it was full two feet deep around me, and the danger of exposing myself to discovery by my tracks in the snow compelled me to keep close to my hiding place until the third day, when I ventured to go back to the road, which I found broken by the passage of numerous wagons, sleds, and horses, and so much beaten that I could travel it with ease at night, the snow affording good light. Accordingly, at night I again advanced on my way, which indeed I was obliged to do, for my corn was quite gone, and not more than a pound of my pork remained to me. I travelled hard through the night, and after the morning star rose, came to a river, which I think must have been the Yadkin. It appeared to be about two hundred yards wide, and the water ran with great rapidity in it. Waiting until the eastern horizon was tinged with the first rays of the morning light, I entered the river at the ford, and waited until the water was nearly three feet deep, when it felt as if it was cutting the flesh from the bones of my limbs, and a large cake of ice floating downward forced me off my balance, and I was near falling. My courage failed me, and I returned to the shore, but found the pain that already tormented me greatly increased when I was out of the water and exposed to the action of the open air. Returning to the river, I plunged into the current to relieve me from the pinching frost that gnawed every part of my skin that had become wet, and rushing forward as fast as the weight of the water that pressed me downward would permit, was soon up to my chin in melted ice, when, rising to the surface, I exerted my utmost strength and skill to gain the opposite shore by swimming in the shortest space of time. At every stroke of my arms and legs they were cut and bruised by cakes of solid ice, or weighed down by floating masses of congealed snow. It is impossible for human life to be long sustained in such an element as that which encompassed me, and I had not been afloat five minutes before I felt chilled in all my members, and in less than double of that time my limbs felt numb, and my hands became stiff and almost powerless. When at the distance of thirty feet from the shore my body was struck by a violent current, produced by a projecting rock above me, and driven with resistless violence down the stream, wholly unable to contend with the fury of the waves, and penetrated by the coldness of death in my inmost vitals, I gave myself up for lost, and was commending my soul to God, whom I expected to be my immediate judge, when I perceived the long hanging branch of a large tree sweeping to and fro, and undulating backward and forward, as its extremities were washed by the surging current of the river just below me. In a moment I was in contact with the tree, and making the effort of despair seized one of its limbs. Bowed down by the weight of my body, the branch yielded to the power of the water, which, rushing against my person, swept me round like the quadrant of a circle, and dashed me against the shore, where, clinging to some roots that grew near the bank, the limb of the tree left me, and springing with elastic force to its former position, again dipped its slender branches in the mad stream. Crawling out of the water, and being once more on dry land, I found my circumstances little less desperate than when I was struggling with the floating ice. The morning was frosty, and icicles hung in long pendant groups from the trees along the shore of the river, and the hoar-frost glistened in sparkling radiance upon the polished surface of the smooth snow, as it whitened all the plain before me, and spread its chill but beautiful covering through the woods. There were three alternatives before me, one of which I knew must be quickly adopted. The one was to obtain a fire, by which I could dry and warm my stiffened limbs. 
The second was to die without the fire. The third, to go to the first house, if I could reach one, and surrender myself as a runaway slave. Staggering rather than walking forward, until I gained the cover of a wood, at a short distance from the river, I turned into it and found that a field bordered the wood within less than twenty rods of the road. Within a few yards of the fence I stopped, and taking out my fire apparatus, to my unspeakable joy, found them dry and in perfect safety. With the aid of my punk and some dry moss gathered from the fence, a small flame was obtained, to which dry leaves being added from the boughs of a white oak tree that had fallen before the frost of the last autumn had commenced, I soon had fire of sufficient intensity to consume dry wood, with which I supplied it, partly from the fence and partly from the branches of the fallen tree. Having raked away the snow from about the fire, by the time the sun was up my frozen clothes were smoking before the coals, warming first one side and then the other. I felt the glow of returning life once more invigorating my blood and giving animation to my frozen limbs. The public road was near me on one hand, and an enclosed field before me on the other but in my present condition it was impossible for me to leave this place to-day, without danger of perishing in the woods or of being arrested on the road. As evening came on, the air became much colder than it was in the forenoon, and after night the wind rose high and blew from the northwest with intense keenness. My limbs were yet stiff from the effects of my morning adventure, and to complete my distress I was totally without provisions, having left a few ears of corn that I had in my pocket on the other side of the river. Leaving my fire in the night, and advancing into the field near me, I discovered a house at some distance, and as there was no light or sign of fire about it, I determined to reconnoiter the premises, which turned out to be a small barn, standing alone, with no other inhabitants about it than a few cattle and a flock of sheep. After much trouble I succeeded in entering the barn by starting the nails that confined one of the boards at the corner. Entering the house I found it nearly filled with corn in the husks, and some from which the husks had been removed was lying in a heap in one corner. Into these husks I crawled, and covering myself deeply under them soon became warm, and fell into a profound sleep, from which I was awakened by the noise of people walking about in the barn, and talking of the cattle and sheep, which it appeared they had come to feed, for they soon commenced working in the corn husks with which I was covered, and throwing them out to the cattle. I expected at every moment that they would uncover me, but fortunately before they saw me they ceased their operations, and went to work, some husking corn and throwing the husks on the pile over me, while others were employed in loading the husked corn into carts, as I learned by their conversation, and hauling it away to the house. The people continued working in the barn all day, and in the evening gave more husks to the cattle and went home. Waiting two or three hours after my visitors were gone, I rose from the pile of husks, and, filling my pockets with ears of corn, issued from the barn at the same place by which I had entered it, and returned to the woods, where I kindled a fire in a pine thicket, and parched more than half a gallon of corn. Before day I returned to the barn, and again secreted myself in the corn husks. In the morning the people again returned to their work, and husked corn until evening, at night I again repaired to the woods and parched more corn. In this manner I passed more than a month, lying in the barn all day and going to the woods at night. But at length the corn was all husked, and I watched daily the progress that was made in feeding the cattle with the husks, knowing that I must quit my winter retreat before the husks were exhausted. Before the husked corn was removed from the barn, I had conveyed several bushels of the ears into the husks near my bed, and concealed them from my winter's stock. Whilst I lay in this barn there were frequent and great changes of weather. The snow that covered the earth to the depth of two feet when I came here did not remain more than ten days, 
and was succeeded by more than a week of warm rainy weather, which was in turn succeeded by several days of dry weather, with cold high winds from the north. The month of February was cloudy and damp, with several squalls of snow and frequent rains. About the first of March the atmosphere became clear and dry, and the winds boisterous from the west. On the third of this month, having filled my little bag and all of my pockets with parched corn, I quitted my winter quarters, about ten o'clock at night, and again proceeded on my way to the north, leaving a large heap of corn husks still lying in the corner of the barn. On leaving this place I again pursued the road that had led me to it for several nights, crossing many small streams in my way, all of which I was able to pass without swimming, though several of them were so deep that they wet me as high as my armpits. This road led nearly northeast, and was the only road that I had fallen in with since I left Georgia that had maintained that direction for so great a distance. Nothing extraordinary befell me until the 12th of March, when, venturing to turn out earlier than usual in the evening, and proceeding along the road, I found that my way led me down a hill, along the side of which the road had been cut into the earth ten or twelve feet in depth, having steep banks on each side, which were now so damp and slippery that it was impossible for a man to ascend either the one or the other. While in this narrow place I heard the sound of horses proceeding up the hill to meet me. Stopping to listen, in a moment almost two horsemen were close before me, trotting up the road. To escape on either hand was impossible, and to retreat backwards would have exposed me to certain destruction. Only one means of salvation was left, and I embraced it. Near the place where I stood was a deep gully cut in one side of the road, by which the water had run down here in time of rain. Into this gully I threw myself, and lying down close to the ground, the horsemen rode almost over me and passed on. When they were gone I arose, and descending the hill, found a river before me. In crossing this stream I was compelled to swim at least two hundred yards, and found the cold so oppressive, after coming out of the water, that I was forced to stop at the first thick woods that I could find, and make a fire to dry myself. I did not move again until the next night, and on the fourth night after this came to a great river, which I suppose was the Roanoke. I was obliged to swim this stream, and was carried a great way down by the rapidity of the current. It must have been more than an hour from the time I entered the water until I reached the opposite shore, and as the rivers were yet very cold, I suffered greatly at this place. End of chapter 18, part 1